Not that I like inter interrupting your lunch and all the good conversation, but I also am aware that students have one o'clock classes and they flee like the swallows and Capistrano come one o'clock. So we wanna make sure we have clearly enough time for questions and answers. I'm Ray Remy, I'm the uh, chair of the Rose Institute Board of Governors and we're delighted that you'd come and spend some time with us. I think on the most interesting topic and subject uh, I think most all of us, particularly those interested in government, would recognize that you can't have a successful democratic society if you don't have a free and fair press. It's one of the things that separates our country from many of the other large, powerful countries in the world. And yet today, all we have is fake news. There is no thing, such thing as accurate reporting. It's all fake news. And. Uh, the entire respect and reputation of the press is constantly uh, at the pits. Um, we have all sorts of problems, and we find out that not only do we get our news differently, that the methods by which we now get it, whether it's a handheld device, those electronic news now will give us leads and news created by artificial intelligence that gets us information that, that coincides with our prejudices rather than with our intellectual inquiry. That we have uh, news being fed to us whether we want it or not because it just justifies what we already believe. So how do we maintain a fair, free and fair press? Steve Lopez, who's one of the really fine writers for the LA Times, was reflecting in a column uh, about the fact that the LA Times is now moving uh, out, to the, out to the beach. They have their first homegrown owner since the Chandler family. Uh, they've gone through a series of corporate iterations which has devastated the paper. And as uh, Lopez said, the first five newspapers I worked for in Woodland, in Pittsburgh, California, in Concord, Oakland, and in San Jose, all no longer exist. And we're seeing that in media after media, and we are indeed fortunate to have someone who has spent their time and their life up to now in this very, very complicated, difficult, and in many cases shrinking industry. Uh, the industry is supported by advertising, which has now fled to the electronic side, no longer can support the print media. David Lesher, who is kind enough to come join us, um, uh, is with, uh, has launched and heads uh, Cal Matters, which is the largest news staff in Sacramento at this stage. It is uh, different than the traditional uh, newspaper, the Sacramento Bee and others. Uh, he's had 25 years of experience with the Los Angeles Times and, and uh, other political writings. He's been a state capital reporter, national editor for the White House campaign. Uh, California Journal, which we've had uh, Tony Quinn with us for a while. Uh, uh, he has been uh, an editor of the California Journal, so he has seen it for the first hand, the industry where it is, the profession where it is, and is indeed uh, heading now a, a most interesting and fascinating uh, experience in Sacramento because he has the largest group of reporters in his organization that you'll have in any bureau, not the Times, not the not the bee. So it's my pleasure to welcome and, and uh, thank uh, Dave Lesher uh, for coming down and spending some time and talking about media trends, the profitless, and the nonprofits. Dave. Well, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to this. Um, the stars lined up, I think, a little bit for this for this uh, talk today. Um, I, first of all, Jeff Klein is uh, uh, on our board of directors and we share Jeff with the uh, Claremont McKenna College Board. Um, Deborah Gonzalez uh, and I, we overlapped at the Public Policy Institute of California and I understand this is her first meeting at the board. Um, Grace Bailey, is, is she here? She was gonna, Grace Bailey is, at, is a senior here and uh, she is the daughter of two of the two of my friends from the LA Times Sacramento Bureau. So, 
Uh, and then my mother lives across the street at, at Pilgrim Place. So, um, so I think coming here and talking is very familiar. I know all the good restaurants around here, and I walk through here frequently. So, um, so I'm looking forward to this. Uh, so I, I want to start by talking about the changing technology and the news media. And I want to talk about you know, what's happening in the media. Then I think some of, the, some of what the effect is on the public policy process, especially at the state level. And then what we're doing at Cal Matters in response to those things. So my first job in newspaper was at the Hartford Current in Connecticut in 1980. And the Current's claim to fame uh, is that it, was, it is the oldest continuously publishing newspaper in the country. Mark Twain wrote for it, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Nathaniel Hawthorne. It even covered the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And the joke in the newsroom, and it was true, is that the paper played the signing of the Declaration on page two. <laughs> so, and, and it also ran 11 days after the, the Declaration was signed. But that was the technology at the time. Uh, you know, the horse, the horse was the telephone, it, so it took a while to get the news from Philadelphia to Hartford. Back then, much of the, um, back then, much of the paper was also laid out chronologically because it was so hard to set the type. So fast forward to 1980, when I got to The Current, reporters had only been working on computers for a few months. In fact, my internship at the LA Times the previous year, we were still using manual typewriters, and editing was done with pencil, eraser, scissors, and glue pots. So between 1776 and 1980, there was plenty of change in the newsroom, but not nearly as much as there's been in the last 38 years since 1980. This has uh, one of my favorite science blogs, Wait But Why. And if you haven't read it, it's great. But it calls this the law of accelerating returns means that progress is not linear, that more advanced societies advance more quickly because they are more advanced. And so progress is an increasingly sloping line, and lately, especially, it even looks like a hockey stick. So you're certainly aware of a lot of the changes, but just a quick reminder, you know, just under our last governor, Schwarzenegger, the internet was still a primarily a text-based medium. You know, it wasn't until 2004 when we started to see ubiquitous high-speed broadband and that allowed us to do the instant photos and videos that we take for granted today. You know, in 2004, Facebook and Google, Facebook was founded, Google went public. 2005, Twitter, 2006, YouTube, and 2007, barely a decade ago, we saw the first iPhone. So this has happened incredibly fast. Our policymaking process has changed dramatically as a result, and it's still changing. Um, and I'll talk more about that soon. First, I want to talk about the impact on the media because it's been catastrophic. And I'm going to focus on print for two reasons. One, that's where the impact has been the greatest. And two, because print is often a source for news broadcasts or television. Uh, so these two lines really capture what's happened. Uh, according to the Pew Research Center, Newspaper advertising dropped from about $50 billion in 2005 to $18 billion a decade later. Meanwhile, in just the past five years, digital advertising grew, uh, all doubled, more than doubling, to $60 billion. But, and here's the shift, 65% of the digital ad revenue went to five technology companies, Google, Facebook, Yahoo, Microsoft, and Twitter. Meanwhile, newspapers, have increased their ad revenue to about 25, digital ad revenue to about 25% of their total. But in 2015, their digital revenue dropped even as the pie grew, suggesting that newspapers may be losing their attraction even for digital ads. So this chart represents the transfer of wealth, but not yet the responsibility from print to technology companies. In California, the impact has been even more devastating on our media partly because some of our state's largest news organizations entered this period and took on significant debt from media purchases just at the wrong time. So I'll start with um, Digital First. I, I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but they're the second largest news chain in the country. Uh, they own about nearly 40 newspapers here in California, 
including some of our most prominent. They own the Bay Area News Group up north, which includes the San Jose Mercury News and East Bay Times. They, here in LA, they own the Southern California News Group, which includes the LA Daily News, Riverside Press Enterprise, Orange County Register, and papers in Long Beach, San Bernardino, Torrance, Whittier, and others. Their combined circulation in California is by far the largest in the state and more than double the jointly owned LA Times and San Diego Tribune. So Digital First is owned, is based in Denver and is owned by a hedge fund called Alden Global Capital. And the company was created about five years ago through a merger and a bankruptcy. Alden tried but couldn't sell the company in 2014 and since then, Alden has become, uh, become a, an example nationally of what's called vulture capitalism. In other words, it's not just the internet that is hurting newspapers. A 2016 study at the University of North Carolina called The Rise of a New Be Media Baron and the Emerging Threat of News Deserts said more than a third of the country's newspapers have changed ownership since 2004. Most large chains are still growing and owned by investment fund managers with newspapers representing a fraction of their portfolios. And most companies are employing a standard formula to manage the newspapers involving aggressive cost cutting paired with financial restructuring. So as the Nation Magazine put it recently, Digital First is not trying to keep its newspapers alive, it's trying to siphon off the assets and profits and then dispose of what, rem what remains. The News Guild at the Digital First newspapers have, have the News Guild estimates that the, the Digital First newspapers have cut staff at twice the national rate, with a 36 percent reduction in just the last two years. So, in the in the subtitle of my comments today about the profitless, the profitless is also not true. Actually, media experts estimate the Digital First is still producing a 10 to 20 percent profit, even as it makes these cuts. So just last week, or I should say two weeks ago, this whole scene erupted uh, after another round of lay layoffs and caused the staff at the chain's flagship newspaper, the Denver Post, to revolt. Without saying anything to their bosses, they wrote front page editorials telling their owners to either invest in the paper or sell them. And that prompted similar editorials at the Bay Area News Group and at the Southern California News Group. Meanwhile, an employee website called dfmworkers.org is posting regular updates and the hashtags News Matters and Alden Exposed have become popular. Many feel that these newspapers could be lost in the next two years unless new ownership is identified. In Denver, with the help of the governor and the mayor, donors have put up $10 million in the last two weeks. The Bay Area News Group and SCNG, the Southern California News Group, are talking about new ownership or the possibility of going nonprofit in the editorial that even mentions Cal Matters as a high quality example of journalism being pr produced by nonprofits. So just quickly to talk about the other, uh, the other changes in California media, uh, as we heard the LA Times going through an enormous change after a long period of, of upheaval. For the last, the Times was just sold to Patrick Soon Chong. Uh, in February, uh, he's a wealthy surgeon and an entrepreneur from Los Angeles with a net worth estimated at $9 billion. Um, I, I, there are still a lot of great people working at the LA Times and at Digital First. We, we do work with both of them very closely. And even with all the challenges, the, the LA Times still has maintained a good presence in Sacramento. But they've been through 20 years of a roller coaster. Uh, you know, it was owned by the Chandler family for 100 years, and then in Tribune bought it in 2000. In 2007, it was sold to a developer, Sam Zell. In 2008, it went bankrupt. In recent years, it's lost half of its staff. It's had four different publishers in the last four years. Uh, in January, the staff voted to unionize 248 to 44. And in February, the, the paper was sold to Sun Chong um, for about $600 million, actually $500 million in cash and $90 million in, uh, uh, in debt that was acquired. And by comparison, Jeff Bezos walked, bought the Washington Post for about $250 million. 
So everybody's uh, hopeful that Soon Chong will mean quality and stability for the paper, as he has indicated in his comments, but nobody really knows. This is a very new business for him. Quality and sustainability surely mean more investment on his part, and there's no indication about what new business model the Times might try to apply to conditions today. The deal is also not closed, but it is expected too soon, and so far there has been no announcement about new leadership at the paper, who, who will be the new publisher or the new editor. Finally, we have the, the McClatchy chain, uh, the third largest in, the, in uh, the nation, with the Sacramento Bee and five other papers in California. They've had several rounds of layoffs, uh, including on Tuesday, just this week, there were 22 new uh, layoffs at the Sacramento Bee. Uh, they've cut, they also cut pages from their uh, opinion section uh, this week. They have a new CEO who started last week, um, and they've replaced editors at, at their top two papers, and, and actually at all five newspapers in California. So, so what does this all mean? Um, I'm going to talk about the impact on the policy process at the state level uh, for a couple reasons. That's what we do at CalMatters. Uh, it's also, I think, um, state news is impacted more than other levels because it's just easier to cut uh, it's, and, and without hurting readership. Um, and three, you know, the state level has more impact on your life as a Californian, I think, than any other level of government. California state government has major responsibility for schools and universities, transportation systems, health care, courts, prisons, public safety, the environment, climate change, ecosystem management, parks, water for drinking and agriculture, poverty programs and housing, its policies on labor laws, minimum wage, business regulation and taxes affect the op economic opportunities for 19 million workers. In California, state government collects more than $100 billion each year in taxes and fees and its lawmakers make decisions about how to spend about $290 billion every year including funds from federal government. It has a $2.6 trillion economy, the sixth largest in the world, and generates 14% of US GDP. That matters. The issues that determine California's future are also enormous today. We have the highest poverty rate in the nation. Our average housing cost is more than double the US. Our spending and academic performance in K-12 schools is below national averages. And overall, we are a high-cost state with some very expensive unfunded obligations. So there are consequences for all of this work being done without adequate public awareness or accountability. So to show you how, to show you how I'm going to start by going back 15 or so years to 20 years to the last days before the hockey stick curve, when I covered the governor's office for the Los Angeles Times under Pete Wilson and Gray Davis. There were 15 reporters in the Times Sacramento Bureau alone back then. There were full-time reporters covering the Senate, the Assembly, and the Governor. There were reporters writing for the business section. There were full-time reporters assigned to the delegations for the paper sections in the San Fernando Valley and Orange County and San Diego. There were columnists and editors. Every day, page three in the newsroom was reserved for state news. Back in Back in, uh, in Los Angeles, there were also reporters covering beats like healthcare and the environment and education, who would also write stories from the Capitol when there was a major issue on their beats. Dozens of other papers and several TV stations also had Capitol News Bureaus, of course, many with multiple reporters. In all, it's hard to tell, but I'd guess there were probably 40 or more reporters covering the Capitol full time. Today, the full time press corps is barely a quarter of that size. Outside of the LA Times and the Sacramento Bee, I'm only aware of two newspapers, two newspaper reporters in Sacramento today, one for the San Francisco Chronicle and one for all of the digital first newspapers. So when I was in the Sacramento Bureau, my full-time job was covering everything the governor did or said. I followed him everywhere and I worked with his staff every day. I was intimately aware of regular progress on any issue in the executive branch and I probably wrote two to four stories per week with time to call sources, no tweeting, no Facebook, no blogs. Um, same with our reporters covering the legislature. When I was there, the two reporters in the legislature, Carl Ingram in the Senate and Jerry Gillum in the Assembly, had been covering it for more than 25 years each. 
So you can imagine the resources this paper had to draw on to cover a major piece of legislation as it passed through the Assembly, then the Senate, and then to the Governor's office. We followed it with insightful coverage at each step. Our reporters knew the issues, we knew the people, and we had time to talk to the stakeholders before we put our stories together. So it should be clear why this kind of saturation coverage by expert reporters for the LA Times, in addition to deeper resources at other newspapers and television and radio at the time, would shape the policy making process. The reporters were part of the process, so the public was too, and that's what has changed. When Pete Wilson had a major initiative he wanted to push through the legislature, his strategy was often to build public support so he could pressure the legislature. A common strategy was to leak a story to the LA Times because it was the biggest paper in the biggest media market in hopes that it would run in the Sunday paper because that was the biggest circulation day. Then he would schedule a press conference in Los Angeles on Monday because that's where he could get the most television cameras. That was the bully pulpit. Even with that, Wilson always complained that it was difficult to communicate with a state as large as California, but today there is no bully pulpit. The process has changed so that the perception among policymakers is that it's either not necessary, necessary to pass their policies or it's not available. Take a look at what happened last year with the gas tax increase. California has a $130 billion backlog in road repairs. We are way past the point where the repairs are growing more expensive because we failed to keep up with maintenance. Some major roads are in crisis condition. The legislature tried to pass funding for repairs in 2015, but failed. In 2016, the governor called a special session on transportation funding, but after a year, it ended without a vote, even though business groups thought the problem was so severe they announced support for the gas tax increase. Last year, with the bare number of votes, the governor got a two-thirds vote to raise the gas tax by 12 cents and generate about $52 billion over 10 years. He and legislators spent about a billion dollars in benefits to buy the swing votes they needed, including $500 million for a commuter rail line in Merced. Um, so how much did you hear about this vote? How much do you know about the major problems with the state's road system? For more than two years, this was one of the biggest issues in the state legislature. How many news stories were done about this issue? There were some, but not many, certainly not as many as there would have been a decade ago. But there was also virtually no attempt by the governor or policymakers to generate a public discussion about this major issue that was going to require a significant public sacrifice of a 12 cent gas tax increase. Part of that is the difficulty of communicating today, and part is that the policy process achieves its goals without it. But does it? There was, there's now a ballot measure seeking to qualify for November to repeal the gas tax increase. Supporters said just on Tuesday this week that they have collected enough signatures, so it sounds like this will be on the ballot in November. Republican leaders are pushing it partly because they think it will help generate turnout to keep their congressional seats that are being targeted. And since voters have never heard uh, about why we need this tax, polls indicate that the repeal could pass. If that happens, the road remains unrepaired, the roads remain unrepaired, and the next governor starts all over again. Uh, one other institution that has changed significantly is the annual State of the State speech. Uh, it used to be a major state institution and a powerful opportunity for the governor to lay out an agenda for the state and to, to seek public support. It was always given in prime time so it could be broadcast live and statewide. That night, the Capitol would be surrounded by satellite trucks. At the LA Times, the main story was always on the front page with multiple stories inside. Meanwhile, reporters covering the speech would spend all afternoon in a series of briefings from cabinet officials about the initiatives that were going to be launched in this speech. Today, the speech is done in the morning. It lasts about 15 or 20 minutes, and it's no longer a vehicle for launching po policy initiatives. So there's rarely anything new in the speech, and there's very little coverage. In 2007, just 10 years ago, there were 34 news stories about Governor Schwarzenegger's State of the State speech. 10 years later, in 2017, there were six. Nine of the publications that cover Schwarzenegger's speech no longer have reporters in Sacramento. 
Traditionally, the governor has also followed the State of the State speech with a press conference at the Sacramento Press Club. It was another part of the process in rolling out the agenda for the year. This governor has not made a single appearance at the press club, and in general, he has hardly ever done an interview with state media. He gives far more interviews to national media. When there was a large and robust press corps, I think he would have paid a political price for that, but today he is powerful and popular. Uh, the, the change is also apparent to me in the relations between reporters and staff in the legislature and the executive branch. When the media was part of the policy-making process, the executive and legislative offices needed the media to achieve their goals. Today, that need isn't there and has changed the quality of the relationship. For one thing, in general, uh, I think government is just more thin-skinned and quick to attack reporters. Our Cal Matters reporters have good relations with most offices, but we've had a few experiences that I could not have imagined in my LA Times days. When Cal Matters did a series of stories in collaboration with the LA Times about public pension debt, staff in the Assembly's of Speaker's Office tweeted about us having right-wing donors and calling us scam matters. When we did a story that raised questions about whether the state was going to achieve its climate goals in 2020, we got a very critical email from the State Air Resources Board with bullet points that appeared to be taken from an that appeared to be taken from an environmental group's email that was leaked to us earlier. Then the Air Resources Board called some of our media port partners and told them not to run the story. Just very aggressive. Uh, and it, we've had two interviews with this governor over three years. And in the first, he said some things that got him in trouble with some education groups. So we printed the story, but we also printed the full transcript of the interview we had with him. But the, we got an email from the governor's press secretary that said, quote, I understand you have a job to do and clicks to drive, but I think it's intellectually dishonest, cherry-picked, decontextualized, and mischaracterized the governor's comments to create conflict. So I never understood the cherry-picking complaint. We ran the full transcript. Uh, I can't imagine anything like these examples happening when I was at the LA Times Bureau. There were plenty of complaints about stories, but there was a much more respectful discussion. Finally, peeling back another layer, there's less information about policy programs that is available today, and I think that reflects a small, per, smaller press corps asking fewer questions. I'll talk about two stories we've done at Cal Matters where our in-depth research left questions unanswered. That climate change story that stirred up the Air Resources Board was our attempt was our attempt to do a report card about how the state was doing in trying to achieve the landmark climate change, goal, climate change goals it set 10 years earlier in AB 32. Back then, the state said it would reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by 2020. And because we would be a global leader in green technologies and strategies, it predicted a significant economic benefit in terms of jobs, personal income, and gross state product. This is an enormous and very admirable and impressive effort by California, but it's especially difficult for one state to do by itself, and in a state that already has high costs, we can see that these policies have raised prices for gasoline, electricity, new housing, and businesses. So are we going to achieve our emission reduction goals, and are we going to see an economic benefit? The answers from the administration are yes and yes. And from a, what we could see in our reporting, it's possible. And that's not a small thing because this is a major effort. But when we started this story, I wanted to build two charts. One was a dashboard about how the state was going to achieve its 2020 goals, showing the trend lines of the emission reductions achieved and expected from the state's various climate policies. The other was about the state's cap and trade program, where polluters can buy or sell emission credits depending on whether they are above or below the emissions cap. I think it would be interesting to know, especially for consumers, who are the polluters, polluters in the state and which ones are making the effort to get below the threshold and which ones are above the threshold and have to buy credits. And despite our significant effort, including an intervention by our attorney, we could not create either of these charts. The Legislative Analyst's Office also testified to the legislature that last year that based on the information they have from the Air Resources Board, 
they could not conclude definitively that the state would achieve its 2020 goals. So another story was about the local control funding formula for K-12 schools. This is a major policy that redistributes $70 billion a year in state funding with the goal of simplifying the process uh, and closing the state's academic achievement gap between advantaged and disadvantaged students. The plan creates a base amount of money for each student and then adds more for every English learner or low-income child. It was adopted five years ago, and the state says it is still too early to evaluate whether it's working, but there is significant concern among civil rights and community groups and some academic experts. So last year, we looked at the 15 districts with the greatest need and the greatest amount of extra funding, where academic researchers suggested we would find the best opportunity to see if there has been any improvement. What we saw was little or no improvement in those 15 districts, and in many cases, the achievement gap actually widened. Sometimes that was because disadvantaged students improved, but not as much as others. But in all districts, all 15 districts, the gap widened in at least one of the four categories for measurement. So in this case, it would be good to know how did these districts spend that extra, that extra money that is intended to support the education of disadvantaged students. But the state doesn't require districts to share that information, and in our reporting, looking at all of the local school district budget documents and talking to their top budget staff, we could not see how it was spent in most of the districts we have examined. So in the last 10 to 15 years, not that long of a period actually, I think these are some of the costs of a smaller press corps. We've lost the bully pulpit, the state of the state, an annual platform for common dialogue and how to solve our problems is gone. Government and press relations are strained. And finally, data needed for evaluation of major policy programs is weak. These are the symptoms of a news desert. The risk is that when independent news is gone, the only message left comes from advocates, interest groups, and political manipulators. Dialogue becomes more polarized, election outcomes can change, and the facts don't matter because facts from these sources cannot be trusted. So I want to describe CalMatters because we are still new and we exist in response to many of the issues I've described. Our mission is to raise public awareness about state policy issues and create more transparency in the policymaking process. We are part of a national trend in nonprofit multimedia content providers. Just 10 years ago, there were about two dozen members of the Institute for Nonprofit News. Today, there are nearly 200. We are mid-size in the sector with a budget of about $3 million per year and a staff of about 20 based in Sacramento. Our model was not to compete with existing media by duplicating what is still being done, but to complement their work and replace what is being lost. As a, as a result, we don't, we don't write many of the what happened today stories. We focus on news analysis or in-depth policy coverage. So we hired a team of experienced reporters who know their topics and know how the policy process works. Our environmental reporter won a Pulitzer Prize at the LA Times for environmental coverage. Our political analyst was in the Capitol Bureau for the Sacramento Bee. Our education reporter was a prize winner at the San Jose Mercury News. Last year, we added Dan Walters, a must-read columnist from the Sacramento Bee, and last month, we added Dan Moraine, the editorial page editor from the Sacramento Bee, who, will, who just started a brand new daily newsletter and will soon curate a commentary section for Cal Matters, partly because so many of the opinion sections that produce so much valuable uh, commentary are being cut back so much. We're looking to help create a, a statewide forum for advocate and expert voices on the state's major policy issues. So it's a great team with a lot of depth and experience. We share our stories at no cost with more than 130 print, broadcast, and online news sources around the state, including all of the major newspapers that have run our stories and many of the leading public radio stations. So today, less than three years after our launch, we are the largest news organization covering statewide issues in terms of staff size and reach. And part of the future of journalism is also collaboration because in many cases, news organizations can no longer do major projects all by themselves. 
So as I mentioned, we recently completed a one-year investigation with the Los Angeles Times and Capital Public, Public Radio about the state's pension debt problems that won a first place award from the California News Publishers Association. With a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, we also recently launched a two-year project with four public radio stations around the state and with digital first newspapers called What Happened to the California Dream. It's about the shrinking capacity of government to deliver services, the cost of living, and what that does to the life decisions of somebody trying to escape poverty or somebody trying to start a career out of college and what those life decisions mean for the future of the state. I think this collaboration is one of the benefits of the change in media. We will be coordinating a statewide story on multiple print and broadcast platforms over a two-year period that would never have happened before. A project like this would have been done by a single organization. Together, we have about a dozen people working on it, and we're hoping to drive a public statewide discussion statewide. So lastly, let me end with uh, a, a, to talk a little bit about the election coverage. Um, look at this picture from the 1986 U.S. Senate campaign of Senator Alan Cranston. <laughs> uh, I'm down there in the middle over there. Um, there are eight reporters traveling all over the state on a bus trip with candidates. You'll see a bunch of celebrities in there who who were there to make the senator look younger and hipper. I was at the LA Herald Examiner then, and I spent a full year full-time covering this race. The LA Times had two full-time reporters on this race. And as you can see, there's eight reporters covering all the major newspapers in the state who were on this bus for a week and a half near the end of the campaign. Today, in a year when we have a U.S. Senate race and an open seat for governor, there are no reporters on any race full time. Campaign stories are written by reporters who cover other things, and it makes a difference. US, the, the U.S. Senate race is, is getting very little attention. U.S. Senator Dianne Feinstein is a heavy favorite for re-election, but that's partly because it's difficult for a competitor to raise money or to gain attention in the media and if we had a handful of, if we had reporters like this, you could certainly have a statewide discussion and a potentially dim, different outcome. So three things to mention quickly about the media and this year's California election. It's difficult, if not impossible, for the campaigns to communicate through the media. Second, a significant part of the campaign is entirely invisible. With new technologies, as we saw with Cambridge Analytica, Campaigns are micro-targeting the specific voters they need with messages delivered by internet and mail that, we, that are invisible. We can't, we can't see what campaigns are being waged. Third, because of the competition for attention in today's media ecosystem, extreme positions are rewarded. So for example, in the governor's race, where we've turned a single payer health plan into a litmus test for candidates about how far they'll go to embrace the left. So CalMatters is bridging a bit of the old and the new. All of our, all six of the major candidates for governor visited our offices in Sacramento recently and we grilled them for about 90 minutes on video with a team of expert journalists. We have now posted a matrix of their positions on all the major state issues and video clips of their responses to key questions as well as the full interview. I don't think any other news organization is going to do anything like that. So for those who want that kind of resource, it, it would not exist without philanthropic journalism. And so if you think this matters, I have two requests. <laughs> you can sign up for Dan Marine's new newsletter at calmatters.org, it's free. Um, and second, we recently launched a membership program just like public radio. There are member benefits like webinars with our reporters and other things. On the site, you know, just please push the, don the donate button. $5 or $20 or $100, we are really working hard to grow our large membership base. We hope this work will encourage civic engagement. In the last primary for governor in 2014, barely a quarter of the state's registered voters cast a ballot, and that was an all-time low. It's hard to say that the record low turnout was caused by the decline in state media, but it also seems obvious that there will be less participation in a process that is increasingly invisible. So thank you.
So I hope we have, uh, oh, we're cool, we're close on time, right? Great, um, so now we'll open up to questions. Um, yeah, so his preference goes to students and members of the board. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. I actually got tuned on to Cal Matters after Dan Walters joined your organization as a long time reader, his column. So I've appreciated that and your coverage of the uh, public pension crisis I thought was terrific also. Uh, my question is, so obviously what you guys are doing in Cal Matters is pretty innovative and new. Um, do you see other kind of legacy media organizations cashing up and kind of moving into the space that you're moving on your coverage? Are you optimistic about the future? So you kind of talk us through kind of the dismal crisis of the, of the past. Is there a reason to be hopeful moving forward or? Not so much. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I, I think if you look at the New York Times, they have been incredibly innovative. You know, they're doing virtual reality news telling. They have interactive data visualizations that are really compelling. Uh, the Washington Post is doing a lot of amazing things. Uh, you know, so I, I think there has been a demonstration that it can be done. Uh, I would hope that the LA Times purchased by Patrick Soon Chong that the investment will be there to do the kind of work that we know can be done now, but that's a big question. That's going to take a significant investment. And at some places like Digital First, um, I think they, I don't know how that's going to happen. I mean, they actually are cutting back on some of the, the and the and the B just uh, cut back on some of their digital journalism staff. Um, so I think you're going to see the, the, some of the answer is some of it, it's gonna, the media is going to break up. They're not all going to respond the same way. Some places won't at all. And, but, you know, it is, it is encouraging to see the ones that are doing well. It's, it's working. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, it was really interesting and also kind of depressing. Um, but, you know, hopefully we're on the, the swing in the right direction. Um, I wanted to ask you if you could go into a little bit more detail about, like, the grants process and how those factor into um, funding your activities. I know there's organizations like the James Irvine Foundation that supports a lot of, like, pro-democracy kind of things with a general kind of broad scope. Um, are there also grants for specific projects or specific topics, for example, like um, environmental issues? Maybe you could receive grants in that way. Like, how does that work with working with those groups? And do you find that they still have that kind of detached um, that detached kind of position where they allow you to do your work or do you find that that also in introduces some kind of pressure big question and good question and lots of questions um, you know it's all about the money I mean the reason why we are able to do Cal matters is because of our donations we unlike we're unique a bit in in the nonprofit space because about 80 85 percent of our funding comes from individual donor don donations and about 10 or 15 percent from foundations. We do, uh, you know, all of our donors over $5,000 are required to sign a statement that was written by the Institute for Nonprofit News that, uh, you know, affirms the in editorial independence of our work. And I, I do not receive calls. I don't get anything from uh, ideas from donors. Uh, so we have that wall. There. We do have, um, the Irvine Foundation is funding us on the California Dream Project. In fact, uh, we are the hub between the radio stations and the Digital First newspapers, and that's what Irvine is funding, uh, an editor position to help us uh, create that kind of a, really a, I think it's a unique platform for telling this story. Um, so, you know, I, we have uh, a lot of integrity invested on our board of directors and in our staff about, about independence and, and credibility, and we have not had any, uh, any real, anything to speak of in terms of attempts to influence. Uh, there are rules we have about not taking funding from an advocacy group to, to fund a whole, a whole beat or things like that, but, um, you know, we've raised, uh, our, our annual budget this year is about $3 million. We've raised about $8 million since we started. Um, so, and you know, there's other groups, there's other groups nationally who are, who are working in the same space and showing that it can be done. Having said all that, you know, when we did the public pension debt story, we took a lot of criticism online for, you know, our donors. <laughs> you know, they just, you know, we have over 100 donors and, you know, it's, they can pick out a couple uh, and, and uh, do tweets about it. So it's not that it's not an issue, but we do what we can to respond. Hi, thank you for your talk. 
Um, I really appreciated your last point about the lack of media awareness about campaigns and the running up to the midterm election. I'm working on a campaign right now and really have noticed that there's kind of a lack of news coverage, which has really surprised me. So I'm wondering, um, at, as the election comes up, you said that you have a staff of 20. How is your organization planning to harness the power of your staff and maybe partnerships with news organizations and other innovations to cover all of the midterm elections that are happening in the state? It's a good question, and we're doing all that we can, but, you know, it's, it's not enough. We, we just last week posted a, a voter guide. Voter guides used to be one of the most valuable things that newspapers did, you know. It was really, it's, a, it's, a ten, it's intended to be a reference for voters before they go in the ballot booth. Um, and, you know, we, we, what we did, we are sharing with all of our media partners, and it takes a lot of work to put it together. What we posted has information about all of the statewide races. There are nine statewide races on the ballot in June, and then there's five propositions. Uh, so my hope is that we can do that work uh, and so that, one, it's out there and that our media partners can, can focus on other things. But, you know, the, there are a lot of very important races where there is no coverage. I, we were really surprised when we went to put together this voter guide and look at the key races for the State Assembly and the Senate, and our reporters tried to find, find out more information about what was happening in these races. There were some very high stakes, important races where there wasn't a single news story written. You know, and so there's, there's news deserts you know, around the state. And, and so those races, the only information getting to voters is gonna come from the campaigns or, or from interest groups or advoca advocates. So, and that will shape who wins. So um, I don't know what the answer to that is. I, we, it's hard, I would love to have enough funding and money and staff to do, there's 120 legislative seats and 53 congressional seats, and then there's the propositions and the statewide races. So it's more than we can do by ourselves, but, um, but we, have, we have one full-time reporter cover, doing work on just the election, and then all of our staff contributes something to it. Um, so we're doing as much as we can, but you know, I, I, st I worry about that there's not enough out there. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Uh, suppose we're reading mostly the local papers, the LA Times and the Daily Bulletin. Uh, how would we know if your organization contributed to the story that we're reading and uh, what they contributed and who was the reporter? Uh, so it's a, it's a good question. We, so our, our, the newspapers are supposed to run our name, our reporter's name, and under the name Cal Matters. And then at the end of the story, it, there's a tagline that says Cal Matters and what we are with our website. Um, we have had a fairly low bar to get, to get our work at, for the first couple of years because we wanted to get as much reach as we can. Now we are we're going back to our all of our media partners with uh, a request for more promotion of our work and branding Cal Matters uh, to get data about the traffic to our stories. Um, to uh, you know we want to deliver our stories more efficiently to them. I mean, in some cases, I'm hoping that we'll be able to feed directly to their websites. Um, if you look on most of the digital first newspapers now, there's actually a Cal Matters page. Uh, you know, and then, um, and then we're hoping actually that they will share revenue from some of the ads on our stories and potentially create a revenue source there. We've, uh, we just started court advertising and uh, membership program and trying to do syndication. But yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, so you mentioned, uh, I think it was just very recently, that the uh, LA Times voted to unionize, as did Chicago Tribune, I know. Uh, so, and I'm curious what you see the role of news, newspaper unions uh, being. Are, are they, are, can they be a bulwark at all against, uh, you know, what's happening to mainstream news, or are they more of a distraction? And then how has that affected uh, your own work at CalMatters? How has it affected Cal Matters? Yeah. Right. Uh, we haven't, I mean, our reporters uh, very much like their jobs and we treat them as well as we can, so we, uh, um, uh, I, I don't know of a union vote yet. Um, but the, uh, 
you know, I, th I think the LA Times is going to, uh, you can see why the union vote happened the way it did. I mean, I, th I think the, uh, a lot of reporters, and you can see it at the Digital First newspaper too, they feel they've got nothing left to lose. I mean, those, those comments and what they did, speaking about their ownership, and there was conversations like that at the LA Times, too, is that this, this job isn't going to be around much longer, and I really care about it, so I want to speak up, up about it. But, uh, and what buttons can you push to, to push back on a corporation that's not responding? Um, you know, the LA Times was owned by Tronk at the time of the vote, and the direction of Tronk had been all over the place and it was unclear where it was going so I think it was an attempt to seize back some control if that's possible but what it what it means going forward uh, at the LA Times I don't know I think uh, everybody's waiting to see what Patrick Soon Chong is like as an owner and uh, but um, uh, you know I don't know if it's going to be an answer I, I it's hard to bargain quality news <laughs> Um, you know, it, and it, I don't see the union vote uh, being a reflection of salary or benefits and things like that. It, it was, uh, I, I mean, there's probably some working conditions uh, that might be bargainable, but um, I don't know. I think the union vote is going to have to be, uh, there's going to be a lot of wait and, wait and see. Great, we probably have time for one more question. Uh, thank you. Um, so you mentioned that officials will sometimes refuse to disclose information now, and I was just wondering what's the justification they give for that, and uh, do you also um, like file? I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear that. Uh, so, so like, what's the reason that they give you for not disclosing information now, and also do you uh, do you follow through with like freedom of information requests, or um, is there any way to kind of push back against them? Um, so those are my questions. So the reason for the on, on the climate change work, uh, the, the cap and trade program, they said it was proprietary information for the, the corporations uh, that, uh, you know, that they were trying to encourage participation in this brand new experimental uh, structure and um, so to, to uh, for businesses to encourage them, them to participate, they, they kept that information private. Um, in this case of the schools, um, they, uh, they, this is the governor's philosophy of subsidiarity. You know, he, there is a feeling that the state is not the place to solve a lot of the problems, that, you know, the, the, that the state can set goals and provide funding, but that what happens to the money and what, how they achieve the goals should be done at the local level. And so, you know, the, this is a huge debate in Sacramento about how much the state's responsibility or role should be. And you know, it, once you start collecting data, and then if you find things that aren't working, then what are you going to do about it? And so, I think that whole question about uh, what data do you collect and what kind of performance metrics you put there depends on what you're going to do with whatever you find. And so that debate is very live and well in Sacramento. Um, and in fact, we asked all of the governor candidates when they come in about this issue of transparency with how this money is being spent and all of them you know I think I uh, think there needs to be more transparency and more accountability than there has been so that's changing and I'm, I'm sorry I didn't hear the last part of the question but I was just I was just I wanted to see like if you will follow up with like freedom of information requests or because um, it seems like if they're I mean, if it's proprietary, then it makes sense, but if yeah. it's, you know, government, then... We, our attorney looked at the way the law was written. I mean, we have filed FOIs in several cases, but, um, I mean, she said that, you know, the, the law was written in a way that makes it very hard to, to win some of those cases. So, you know, we um, you know, it's not going away. We'll, we'll keep doing it. Great. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Lesher. Everyone, please give him a round of applause. Thank you.